Let's do this. I'm wearing red socks just for England tonight. 66. 66, yeah. So where do you want to start? Well, um, I suppose we should start with a discussion of where England are. That's what everybody yeah. wants to know. The World Cup is so close. Uh, the good news is that Michel Platini said that England are lions in winter and lambs in summer. This is a winter World Cup, so surely uh, England are lions. Um, the bad news is that Michel Platini is completely discredited. <laughs> <laughs> The other bad news is if you go through, as I was reading tonight in the Times, England's first choice defence, every mm. single one of them is injured. And it was, it was always going to happen. I mean, if you look at France, the axis of their team's missing. Kanté and Pogba. So it was always going to happen that people were going to be injured and won't have time to recover. And Chilwell got injured last night. So the squads that announced this time next week will have a better idea. But I think if we've learned one thing being England fans, and there'll be a few times this evening that Paul and I will look at each other and go, yeah, we lived through that, we lived through that. If there's one thing England have learned is you cannot take injured players to the World Cup. I mean, you know, the shambles of Beckham in Japan, it was, you know, he, he leapt out of a tackle to protect his metatarsal and Brazil went and equalised. And obviously the whole Wayne Rooney shenanigans... Four remember, years later. Do you remember Wayne Rooney turning up at the hotel in, yes. in, in Germany, walking into the <laughs> foyer late because he just repaired his metatarsal and announcing the big man is back in town? The big man is back in town. And then he, <laughs> and then he went onto the training ground and hit a ball too hard in, in training, trying to, you know, um, overcompensate for being away and um, twanged his hamstring or his calf or something. It was <laughs> injured for the rest. There are a lot of stories like that yeah. in, 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 in the... Uh, I mean, I think story. Platini has a point, doesn't it? Because we yeah. know that throughout the, throughout the intensive period of the league season that we have, and we always have players normally in the last stage of the Champions League, they are knackered in the heat come the middle of, end of June. So he's right, if only they were all fit. And of course, if only England were in a better place mentally after... A pretty lousy run of results. Yeah, I mean, I, I go the other way on that. So the England team has reached a semi-final and a final in the last two tournaments. That is immensely promising. And it's a huge improvement on what I think of as the Nadir for the England team, which was losing to Iceland in Nice um, in 2016. That, I came out of the stadium that day thinking, that's it. I'm, I've had it with this. this is, England are not tournament contenders and never will be. Two years later, they're in a World Cup semi-final, so it teaches you not to not to despair. England fans have had good reason to despair, but something always comes along. I mean, sports about uh, renewal, obviously, and England have renewed themselves. And, and so, when you study the, the the history and the tournament history over this long in a book like this, you 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 realise that um, a little wobble in the summer, and England have had one, isn't terminal. I mean, we were talking about fans earlier, and there's, there's this idea that if things go wrong for three months or things just dip a little bit, regress a little bit, then suddenly, you know, the whole thing's falling apart. That's a slightly English notion, and there's no reason why Gareth Southgate and this squad shouldn't go to Qatar and get themselves going again and be, be serious contenders. Mm. Well, I think the one thing is we will have to learn one fundamental lesson, particularly from the Italy match, is that when we, you know, when we need to have the ball, we need to be able to keep the ball. That's always been England's mm. problem, hasn't it? It's always been England's fundamental problem, even though we've got a great striker at the moment. And, you know, you'll have your views on... Everyone will have their views here, which is as valid as the next person's about who's in midfield or whatever, or the goalkeeper and everything. But, but that's always England's issue, isn't it? They can't control the ball and therefore the tempo of the game, slow it down, speed it up when they need to. But listen, I, I take your point. I, I do take your point. And actually, I, I was thinking about it this morning. I knew we were going to talk. It, it may be a bit of an old-fashioned view, but fundamentally for me, Gareth Southgate has done almost the most important... Obviously, the most important thing would be to win something. But everybody wants to win something. <laughs> but no, but seriously, the next, next most important thing has been to reconnect the public with the England team. And that is really fundamentally important when you think about what our Premier League is like and how big our clubs are and how more and more of them, we've got a Newcastle fan here this evening getting overseas investment and how they want to be in the Champions League and they want to win this. There has been enough occasions in the last 30 years that you and I have done this job where players have said to managers, I don't yeah. want to join up with England. Just yeah. tell them I pulled a hamstring. Harry Redknapp will tell you this. Yeah. Tell them I pulled a hammy. And the fact now, and there are lots of reasons for it, St George's Park, Gareth Southgate, they've all played together since they were 18. I think, that's, I think that is, for me, that is as significant as winning something. I really do. 
Completely. I mean, he, he knew when he took that job over. When you think about what a, the context of him taking over, so England had gone out against Iceland in Nice, and then Sam Allardyce had lasted one game in 67 days. I yeah. mean, the whole operation was on its knees. And the players, I call it disengagement syndrome. So when, when things start to go wrong with England players, they, the, the message they get, and somebody said this to me in 2010 in South Africa, that the thing they think is, here we go again. Yeah. They get fatalistic. They think it's an inquest waiting to happen. They think the thing's collapsing in front of them, and they start to disengage. And they start to want to be back at their clubs where they can play Champions League football. They're in a safer environment. They're not, they're not going to get hounded. Um, and, they, and they don't want to be there. And this is a story, really. Certainly, particularly from 2007, I think, to 2016, England players, or some of them dreaded England duty. Yeah. Yeah. And Gareth Southgate could see that. And he realised, I mean, apart from reconnecting with the public, he realised that he had to reconnect the team with what they were meant to be doing. So he worked a lot on, on uh, togetherness and identity, and he took up all these positions, ethical positions, that made the, manager th made the players think that he was kind of on their side and that they pulled together, it, you know, they had a chance. And, and that's the way it's gone. And that's one of the reasons why I think people shouldn't bail out on the team no. just because of a difficult summer. And, and, and I'm really struck by... Uh... Uh, a lot of people have views on Gary Neville, you know, read, you know, read Gary and all that. I mean, you know, I, I, he's very good company, but I was really struck working with him in the build-up to the Euro final that day, alive, saying to him, Gary, you know, you won absolutely everything as a player. What would it mean? What is the difference if these players win today, winning something for England for the first time since 1966, compared with anything they might win for Manchester United or Chelsea or whatever? And he went, it's a different galaxy. I was really struck by that. Mm. I, di I didn't know what his answer was because I deliberately didn't ask him beforehand because I wanted to react naturally and normally like you would at home. And I was really struck when he was going, for England to win tonight would just be completely stratospheric compared. And, and I think, um, and my point in telling that story is I, I, I believe that this, for this group of players, they know that. And they've got lots of players from Man City who've won everything and, and Liverpool and so forth. Yeah, it's I good. know the captain plays for Tottenham, but they've got plenty of players who've won something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I mean, they they, um, they 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 understand what it means, even if they even if they gave up on it. This current generation know that to win something for England would be um, would be would define them really yes. more than club football would. And but they've they've seen the they've seen the history because. See, if you look at the context uh, with England, it, it doesn't start in 66. It starts in 1950. So England entered the World Cup for the first time in 1950. And, in, and between 50 and 62, when Alf Ramsey, after which Alf Ramsey got hold of them, they won three of their 30, 14 World Cup games. That's, that's disastrous. Mm. So, so the story of under, underachievement actually runs from 1950 to 2022. And Alf Ramsey, Alf Ramsey was the outlier. I mean, Alf Ramsey saw all this and he was, he was party to some of these calamitous results, the two defeats to Hungary, 6-3 and 7-1, the 1-0 yeah. defeat to the USA in Belo Horizonte in 1950. Ramsey came along and, and, and devised a strategy, found a, a group of very, very tough, very um, committed uh, sort of domineering, earthy players and, and, and turned them into a winning machine uh, because he'd seen what had happened before. And then things started to go wrong again. But, but it's a much bigger context. And I think, I think what, I mean, what I've tried to do in this book is to understand all the themes that thread all this together and understand what the fault lines were. I mean, you did it yourself, Mark, in a, in a book. I just went further back, I suppose. <laughs> but it's interesting because, as you say, from 1950 to 1962, it wasn't that the players were bad. I mean, there were some unbelievable Fabulous footballers. Players. Fabulous. You know, to... to I know that you mentioned Tom Finney a lot, and I was privileged to get to know Jimmy Arfield really well. I worked with him a lot, who, was, who played in the 1962 World Cup. And three months before the 1966 World Cup, he is England captain. Uh, maybe even two months before. And then on a Scandinavian tour, which you talk about, someone treads on his foot, breaks a bone, he doesn't play. And, you know, he, he was telling, you know, he said that Tom Finney, and I think you mentioned this as well, was probably the best all-round footballer. Yeah. Better than Stanley Matthews. Definitely. Around there, so you know Tom Finney and Stanley Matthews and Lofthouse and Mortensen and Billy Wright. We we can name them all. Of Johnny Haynes. I mean, incredible footballers. Yeah. But they just never quite, because probably of England's insular attitude, slightly superior attitude to yeah. coaching and formations. It was like, oh, we know best. 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I mean, the, what are they wearing? Like Hungry, it's like, what are they wearing? Yeah. Can't play in those. <laughs> They're slippers. Well, the great Arthur Hopcraft looked at the England players in the 50s and said, I mean, they, they even, they're even dressed wrongly. They, yeah. they, they wear these long, flappy shorts. And yeah. he, he described them as being like a scoutmaster running <laughs> after the scouts, you know. Yeah. And, and, and they did, kind of old, old brill creamed men, you know, yeah. with, with heavy boots and, and old fashioned kits. And the 1950 World Cup actually fascinates me because. The England players, it was like, a, it was like an amateur that golf 1950, tour. Brazil, is it? That's 1950, I think. Yeah. Was yeah, that, 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 that's Billy Wright, is it, number four? Yeah, that's yeah. The, I think that's at the American R. Yeah. And um, so this was like an amateur golf tour. It wasn't, there, was nothing, <laughs> yeah. there was nothing professional about this at all. The players turned up, they didn't have a training ground. Um, they hated the food. They complained there was too much garlic in the Brazilian cook, cooking. Um, Stanley Matthews missed the first match because he was on tour, he was wasn't on he? A, he was on a goodwill tour of Canada. That's how seriously they took it. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, great. England's best player. He's not here. Walter Winterbottom, the, the coach, had to go into the kitchen of the hotel and start rearranging all the menus and everything because the players were moaning so much. They were just eating bananas. Um, and they, they were in a sulk. A couple of them got robbed in their rooms. Um, and for the game against the USA, they stayed in a remote mining town up a, up a hill where, with a dreadful journey down to the game. Yeah. There was, and, and Winterbottom was doing this on his own with a selector, really, and that was it. Yeah. That, was the England, that was England's attempt to win the World Cup yeah. in 1950. The local headlines in the local papers said, the kings of football are here. Yeah. But it was a shambles. And when England went out... Everybody went home. Nobody stayed because watch. that's the first World Cup we deigned to play in, didn't exactly. we? Exactly. Yeah, it started yeah. in 1930, and we didn't fancy it, and we didn't. You know, we, the politics. We didn't like the, the politics. We didn't like FIFA, and we sort of just deigned to turn up in 1950 and got absolutely <laughs> taught a lesson. You know, and, and they all went home. They didn't stay to watch the rest of the tournament. They just went home. So the amazing thing is, it took Alf Ramsey for the marriage, didn't it? Of so we'd had very good footballers 1950 to 66, but slightly shambolic. Coaching, as yeah. you say, selector. It took till it took till it took till sixty six for a marriage between very good players and actually what we would probably call a modern in those days a modern sophisticated approach to coaching and to tactics. Yeah, he he found a Ramsey found a, a system of play that fitted the players he had, and um, it was a functional system. It, well, there was nothing elaborate about it, and again. By 1970, when they went to Brazil, when England had a better team, I think, than in 66, the game was, was, was moving on again, moving on really quickly. It was becoming a more uh, technical game, a faster game. And it, it was there, really, that the, the, the hinge turned, because when England lost to West Germany in Lyon 3-2 in extra time, everything starts to go south from there. That was the, that was the kind of end of the Ramsey glory period from 66 to 70 and it was a glory period it was that, that was the best period in England's history and then they went into this decade two decades of turmoil and difficulty um, that picture nobody born after uh, July 1966 has ever seen the England men's team win a tournament I was 18 months old personally how old were you minus two <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> So yeah. I've got something there, haven't I? Yeah. I was actually alive. I was alive for that. You, yeah. I wasn't cognizant of it, obviously. But there are three of them still alive. Um, George Cohen, Jeff Hurst and Bobby Charlton. And, and they've, they live in their own museum in a way. As you know, you know Jeff Hurst really well. He's a, he's a, he's a wonderful guy. I mean, he's a, he's a lovely man. And he's spent his whole life reliving, really, the mm. hat-trick in that World Cup final. And, and nothing has come along to replace it. No. As of yet. No. Um, but I'm struck though by what you said after 1970, which it wasn't. It, it, they weren't. They weren't catastrophically bad qualifying campaigns, were no, they? There was just no. a just a mishap here and there. It's 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 easy to forget now, but it was really hard to qualify for the World Cup then, wasn't it? There was no, you know, there was no coming second to Macedonia, and you had a playoff and so forth. Oh no, no, it didn't mean that they were a bad side. But um, I think 66 was a kind of blessing and a curse in a way because. The, the, the bad thing it did was to kind of reinforce that sense of entitlement uh, and this belief that England owned the game again. You know, England had it, spent a long time kind of messing around in the foothills, but they were back on the pinnacle. And they always would be on the pinnacle. And that, that just wasn't realistic. It was, it was never going to be that way. So when, so when things slipped in the 70s and 80s, there was this tremendously, uh, ferociously negative reaction. And you remember those, those players and those managers... They, they existed in a kind of maelstrom, really, of, of hostility and, and criticism. And, and, and it was all, I think, partly because the, the, there was this delusion, this underlying delusion that England were the, the dominant force in world football. They weren't. And it wasn't really until 
again, I keep coming back, back to that game in Nice in 2016. It was only then that everybody in this country, I think, just accepted that um, England weren't the, weren't the supreme power, weren't the kings of football, as they were called in 1950. Because I think, I think every other nation, particularly when, you know, the 70s with the Dutch and total football and so forth, and obviously the Germans being as good as they were, all the other nations thought to themselves, so long as we can match England physically and emotionally, yeah. we'll beat them. Because the one thing England will always have is heart. They will never stop, you know, Terry Butcher with his bandage on and so forth. So, so long as we can match them for that, we, we will come out on top because we have a better tactical approach. We have the more sophisticated tactical approach. We are, we, are, we are better footballers. We have a better tactical acumen. And I think England... England definitely rode that for too long, didn't they? For, you know, wedded to, wedded to a system, wedded to 4-4-2. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a clue because if you look at all the points at which England have been relatively successful... It's when they haven't played the English way. Yeah. So Italia 90, Euro 96, and now yeah. with Gareth Southgate. When they played possession football, mainstream European possession football in, in heat, in summer heat in tournaments, and tried to keep the ball by and large, uh, they've been effective. When they played 4-4-2 and been outnumbered in midfield and hit long balls down yeah. the channel and had to chase the ball back when they lose it, it's been disastrous. And even, even Capello and Ericsson, uh, two quite high-level managers, I think, came here initially thinking, well, well, we'll get them to pass the ball and keep the ball. But they gave up. They both gave up. Ericsson particularly gave up quite quickly and said, no, 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 these players aren't going to keep the ball, so we're just going to knock it and send it. And then England, with some very good players in the golden generation, slipped back into that 4-4-2 delusion and got what they deserved, which was three quarterfinals. What, 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 is your, what is your, in your book, your summation of Ericsson? Because he did have the most astonishing array of play. He had a much better squad than you have today. Yeah. If, you, if you compared the squad that played in Germany in 2006 to today's squad, you know, apart from Harry Kane, you know, there wouldn't be many that would get in. And yet the, the no. underachievement of that squad. And, and every time you talk to those players, they go, well, he was very level. And, you know, you would never know at halftime if we were winning or losing. And he was very calm. And, you know, get, it's, it, ironically, it is an England manager, Gar Southgate, who said at halftime in Shizuoka, we got Ian Duncan Smith and we needed Winston Churchill, you know, when England were, <laughs> when, when England were a goal down. And I, and I have to say, the more time goes on, the more critical I feel of Ericsson, that actually you, yeah. didn't, you didn't make, you didn't... You didn't bite the bullet about making a decision, the whole Lampard, Gerrard, boring stuff, but yeah. one, only one of them could play. Yeah, yeah. One of the most technically gifted footballers of a generation, Paul Scholes, in the end, got fed up with it and mm -hmm. left. Yeah. Actually, that, that's a big black mark against your management skills. It's no good to say he was calm and Swedish and, you know, mm, sure. equivalent and all that. Yeah, I could have filled that book with Ericsson stories, yes. really. I mean, yeah. um, the... Um, On or off the pitch? Uh, <laughs> off, mainly, yeah. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> he was... Uh, I, I say in the book, he was promiscuous on and off the pitch. Really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but he, he, they, they thought that the FA actually thought they'd, they'd hired a kind of cool, bureaucratic, technical, you know, Svengali, uh, Svengali, yeah. who'd calm yeah. everything down and he'd keep yeah. the English cool. And, and actually, he was a, a, a man of raging passions, as we know. And um, <laughs> he was. Uh, yeah. He, he, he made the front pages more than he made the back pages, really. Yeah. And it was a complete shock to the FA. I mean, whether they didn't do their homework, I'm not quite sure, but um, he, he, he lived his life. You know, he's got kind of, in a way, quite a refreshing attitude to life because he, he kind of didn't take it too seriously. Yeah. You know? yeah. He knew it was a, it was a great way to, to have a good time. And, um, but his, his management of the players was unfortunate. The timing was, was very unfortunate because I, I stand by the golden generation. I think, I think they were a golden generation of players, so I've tried to rehabilitate them. I mean, I'll read the, I'll read the outfield lineup for you of the team that beat Croatia in Euro 2004, which I think may be the best England team, certainly potentially, of the last 30 years. So the outfield players were Gary Neville, Sol Campbell, John Terry, Ashley Cole, David Beckham, Stephen Gerrard, Frank Lampard, Paul Scholes, Wayne Rooney, and Michael Owen. Yeah, not bad. So, so uh, <laughs> apart from Harry Kane, none of the, no one else would get in that team today. No, and, he, and you, you talk to Jamie Carragher, and Jamie Carragher gets really cross when people say this generation of England players are in a different league. You know, we've found this this wonderful array of, players. and I think there are some wonderful players. I, I like these England players, but Jamie Carragher will say, "What about that team? Do you yeah. think this team is better than that team?" So I, th I think when you when you hear them talk, yeah, to be fair, four or five of them would talk very honestly about this on television in the last three or four years, about why did you fail? 
And, you know, they admit that, the, the you know, the Chelsea-Manchester United thing was raging at the time, wasn't it? And then Liverpool as well. And and that's why I, that's why I'm quite critical of of, of Ericsson actually for for not for not for not getting a handle of it and going. Yeah. Ericsson thinking, wow, what a group of players I've got here. If I can get them all going in the same direction, yeah, then, then the sky's the limit. I mean, that day against Croatia, going into the quarter final against Portugal, I think we all thought, didn't we? Well, beat Portugal. Maybe that maybe that's part of the problem. People, you know, that team yeah. could easily have won the Euros. Maybe I think um, that was the team. They, yeah. Every England player says that that 2004 team uh, was the one. You know, yeah. but I mean, I think Connor's got some penalty shootout clips. We're going to have to get onto this at some <laughs> point. So apologies for this. Um, <laughs> might be a bit triggering this, but yeah, um, exactly. Have you got that? Oh, here we go. So the atmosphere in the stadium that day, you remember, was uh, it was it was yeah. euphoric in a way that. Um, I'm not sure I've experienced it at an England game. I mean, that, again, that was the first win over Germany in a tournament knockout game yeah. since 1966. It yeah. felt like a huge turning point. And at the end, the players all came to the touchline. And I'm no fan of Sweet Caroline myself. I'm a bit sick of it. But, <laughs> but it was, um, you know, it was, it was affecting. It was moving to Not see even the... when Ian Wright sings it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when Ian Wright sings it. Um, <laughs> So anyway, that was a high, and we're, we're, we're going to have to look at penalty, penalty shoot. But I think what's, what's interesting is that whole business of individuals v teams, and that's what we're yeah. saying, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. And you, you know, we've we've often heard it said: it doesn't matter what the sport is, the be, you know, the best team isn't necessarily the best eleven individuals. In fact, quite often, mm. as we prove the point, it's not. Um, and the best, the best, uh, Jimmy Greaves, the best coaches sometimes go, no, you might be one of the best players. Yeah. But I'm not going to play you because you don't fit the team. I think the team is better without you, however good you are in in, in objective, let alone subjective terms. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a fundamental uh, element in tournament winning teams, and they they must have this unity and togetherness, and because yeah. the manager doesn't have them for very long, and the players have to buy into it, and they have to believe in the manager, and they have to enjoy yeah. it, and they have to have momentum, and all those things are very difficult to achieve in the in the very short time yeah. you have. And do you remember Euro 2020? Do you remember the negativity around the, the group stage when people said that Southgate wasn't playing enough attacking players oh, yeah, yeah. and England weren't scoring enough goals and it was all, you know, what a waste. And after the Scotland game, we can't even beat <laughs> Scotland. Yeah, yeah, no, it was very, it was yeah. very negative. But, but I think, I think what, 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 uh, to, what we must always remember about tournament football is because obviously it's not like a league season, you're not going to watch a Manchester City who play 32 amazing matches out of 38 and, mm. and, and blow everybody away. Tournament football, teams who win that, will always, it'll always be moments football. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It will always be two or three moments in any, in, in any game, string those together four or five or six times or win it. So you're never going to watch, so unless it's Brazil 1970, and that's easy to mythologise about it because none of us can really remember it. You know, we haven't sat down and watched it. We've just seen the goals, haven't we? Yeah. Particularly in the final. But do you know what I mean? It, it tends to be, it tends to be a moments, sort of pockets of moments strung together yeah. In particular matches, that wins you that right. We're we're through to the quarterfinal now, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and we don't really want to um, in the emotion of a tournament, and particularly a, a, an exit. Nobody really wants to talk about the the context. The one one exception to that was actually Euro '96, when again England lost to Germany on penalties. But everybody came away from that thinking that England had been reborn. I mean, that, yeah. that was the most positive feel from a calamitous night I yeah. think I've ever seen with England. I mean, everybody kind of believed that the team was going places, and then. Um, and it was, in a sense, because Glenn Hoddle took over and there was continuity and they did quite well in 98. But it was a kind of slightly false dawn, wasn't it, Euro 96? But my God, it was good fun. The, the well, winner... I, remember, I remember I went to the Germany game as a fan in yeah. Euro 96, which right. was really good because then I could compare it with what the atmosphere was like for the semi-final against Denmark. You know, mm. that, for me, that was the best comparison, having been at both games. The fact that I was doing different things didn't matter. It was still the same. It was still that same yeah. sense of excitement. And I think also, as I was saying at the beginning, that same sense of um, the, the, however much we love our Premier League and however much we love the Champions League, that, you know, this is elevated to a different level. And, and um, it, listen, from a television point of view, it tells you everything. When when Chelsea play Man United on Sky, they you know not, this is nothing to do with the editorial. It's great. Two and a half million people watch it. Yeah. You know when when England play in the Euro final, thirty two million people watch it. But you don't have to be a mathematician genius to work out how many people are watching football who don't normally watch football. Yeah. And you know I was getting texts yeah. going book the pub tonight and uh, we're watching the game. And I said well, you hate football. I said yeah, but it's England. Yeah. You know, and there's That's something exactly sort of it. almost primeval deep inside people 
And, and you know, the, the, everyone was talking earlier about when the league season will start again. Everyone will be, come on, England, and come Boxing Day, they won't give them monkeys that no. Liverpool are playing Leicester. No, that's it. I mean, because the England team and the national team of any country belongs to everybody. It belongs to all of us. All you need is citizenship and an affiliation yeah. to say, that's my team. And they can't take, nobody can take that away from you. They can't sell it to... <laughs> to uh, Saudi Arabia no. or Qatar or, <laughs> no. or American, you know, private equity. No. Uh, it, it's yours. It's yours forever. They can fiddle about with it. But everybody owns the England team so that, so that when that team walks on the pitch, you know, there's, there's, there's an inherent connection. And, and that's expressed in the viewing figures. I mean, I mean you, would have, you would have... So you did, the, obviously, the, the final with, with ITV. So you're, so you're talking to 30... Well, well, they weren't all ITV viewers. We, uh, well, I, I mean, you know, and listen, it, everyone knows that most people watch the BBC rather than ITV. <laughs> well, it's, it's, that's fine. We're all, we're all grown-ups. But so we did the semi-final, which was 28 million people. Yeah. Which was bigger than the BBC got for the final. <laughs> and, you know... Yeah. Here, we, here, so, we yeah, here, here we go. Here we go. The single biggest figure for a single channel event in this country ever. So 28 million people. And, you know, God, you're thinking... I, how did I walk into you that? Know, <laughs> you're th I'll give you a pay rise. You know, you are thinking... I, I'm really intrigued, though, there really, that, that, that without having to sell it particularly, people who really aren't interested in football mm. are tugged along somehow. In the way they are a bit with the Olympics and, you know... But mm. there's nothing like football, is there? No, you know, and no. you know, we, we you know we love our cricket, and we all remember the Ashes in two thousand five. But it was twelve million; it wasn't twenty eight million. And the same with rugby World Cup finals; it's twelve million. It's not twenty eight million. There's something about the foot, England football team which I don't think we can, any, even those of us who love it or work in it for this long, can actually quite adequately explain why people go. Like my sister rings me and goes, "I'm watching tonight." Yeah, and I you think it, I think it's it, it's more important now because because society is more and more atomized. I would argue, and we have in many ways, have fewer things to connect us, particularly in these political times yes. we're in. Yeah. So if a... If a and I'll, 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 I must mention the women's team uh, winning the European Championship because, I mean, same thing, you know. Yeah. Um, every, anybody who wasn't connected to that and wasn't enjoying it, um, you know, needs to look at themselves, really. Yeah. It, it was a joyous thing. And it was, it was England's first tournament win since 66. Wonderful team, great manager... Fabulous atmosphere. Wembley was Wembley was a joy. No nasty chanting, no fighting, no yeah. booing of the national anthems. Um, a, a beacon team winning a tournament in England jerseys, um, and I hope I hope that really um, that really freshened the whole thing up. And I, I hope actually that gives the men's team impetus. Mm. You know, I hope they watch that before the Qatar World Cup to show them what it can be like when you when you're successful. And I think I think that I think the same thing about. Pulling everybody along because that day I was playing cricket, men's cricket match, and we were batting, and it was my son and his nephews and their generation, so all under twenty eights, and we were batting, and they were all watching on their phones in the yeah. pavilion. Right. No, they. I mean, they did. They really were. They got their. Someone said, "What's the score?" Got their phones out. So, you know, these are these are boys who love, obviously, up till now, men's football, but you know, completely into it. Going mm. right, we want to watch this. Mm. Whoever's in next, put your pads on. But you know. Those of us who are batting down the end, we're going to watch, and I think I think that's the same thing, though, isn't it? It's sort of being, yeah. it's being towed along in a in a way that that football does that nothing else will. Well, it won't, will it? it never, nothing else will come close to it. No, and I mean, you're 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 front of house, you know, for this World Cup. What 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 is what is your expectation? Do you think it can overcome the kind of the political oddness of it and all and, and all we, the, I mean, we, the discordancy we, of it? Yeah, I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about it and, and the BBC will have done, of course, as well. And I think it's really important that... I, I always put myself on the sofa at home, you know, when I watch telly, and I think, right, if, if I'm watching, I'm going, uh, the first night, the, whoever's on, BBC, ITV, I'm going, OK, come on then. Don't, don't pretend it's not happening. <laughs> you know, don't pretend it hasn't happened. Deal with it. So we've talked a lot about, you know, how we, you know, we need to deal with it up front, how controversial the World Cup is and what the issues are. Um, which which we will do, and then I think after that, and, and, and we'll do that, you know, over the first three or four days in various ways. After that, it is beholden to us to do it in an editorially rigorous way, mm. what, in, in whatever shape that that takes. It may be that nothing happens. The, the truth is, none of us in here know. I mean, I went to. Um, I mean, you love your races. I went to Goodwood Races this summer, and the Qatari sponsor Goodwood, and I was in a box sponsored by the Qataris, 
And the guy who runs the World Cup was in there. So an old colleague of mine at the BBC, Richard Conway, is his PR man. He said, have you, have you met him? I went, no. He said, come and have a chat with him. So me, Sean Custis of The Sun, and Rob Harris of Sky had half an hour. We had 20 minutes with him. He said, ask us anything you want. So, you know, three journos straight in. Mm. Workers' rights, you know, LGBTQ rights and everything. And it was, it was very interesting in that sort of... He, you know, he's American educated, extremely erudite, had 12 years to get this off to Pat to tell us it'll all be fine. And yeah. I suppose the best way to sum it up is what James Cleverly said last week is basically what he'd said to us about how to behave and it'll all be fine, essentially. But of course, none of us know until we go there. But all I do know is that we, the media, whether it be television, radio, newspapers, you know, we need to be ready to report what the reality is if something mm. happens. Yeah. You know, we can't do it. It's there. None of us would choose it to be there. We all know why it's there. We all know what's gone on. You know, we all know what happened in 2010 for them to get it. There's that amazing book by the Insight team, wasn't it? Uh, the Sunday Times Insight team. Yeah. About yeah. about how they got it. Yes. But it's, but it's and, I, and I say with a lot of confidence, if I may, that I know that we at ITV will do that because on the day of the final at Wembley, we were on air at half past six and at six o'clock, it was very apparent to us suddenly what was happening. So there's four of us all in a conversation, you know, down various. And we said, whatever we're going to do in the first half hour of the program, throw it out the window. Mm. We need to we need to report what is going on now. We had some video footage of, you know, people storming and so forth. It doesn't matter if it hangs together a bit. I mean, from a personal point of view, you know, I worked in a rolling news service for 25 years. So that was fine. I mean, I enjoy that challenge. So all I say is I'm, I'm very I know I'm confident editorially we will be doing what we need to do, you know, yeah. If, if it happens. I'm very, I'm intrigued to, I mean, I was at a Lewis game the other night and there, there were these uh, fans, fellow Lewis fans standing around me saying, I'm not watching it. I'm not having anything to do with it. I'm just, I'm turning my back on it. I, they, it's, this pushes me too far. And fans have been pushed a long yeah. way with takeovers of clubs by nation states, with the Super League experiment, the whole exploitation of fans with ticket prices and, and, and all the things we know about. And I'm really intrigued to know whether people will start out boycotting it in their heads and then they'll watch a couple of games and yeah. they'll, they'll see this world-class goal and think, oh, hang on, did you see, you know, Brazil against so-and-so? I'm just going to just have a quick look. And the, and the old narcotic will kick in again yeah. and everybody will just say, well, you know, let's argue about all the other stuff yeah. after the tournament. Um, I, I'm, I'd, I'd love to know what, what people's attitude is. Well, well I, I also think we have to be realistic. You know, things are really tough at the moment. Mm. It's dark. Yeah. It's going to be raining. You know, we've got a cost of living crisis. You don't have to. You're right. You're right you paid your license fee. I take that. You don't have to pay for it effectively. No, true. And it's on. It's on. You know, it's on. There are four kickoff times a day. Uh, UK time. One o'clock. Um, Ten. One. Four. And seven. Well, if it's pissing with rain, you've just got the kids home from school, and it's four <laughs> o'clock. That's quite. And Brazil are playing. That's quite nice, isn't it? Well, and the, the other crucial. Yeah. The other crucial thing. That's quite a nice it. thing. That's quite a nice yeah. thing to look forward to on a Tuesday afternoon. Well, afternoon. it could be. I mean, it, and the other thing, of course, is they've taken away your club football. So yeah, I was I was looking at the fixtures, and um, so Manchester United play on Sunday week against Fulham, 13th of November, and yeah. they don't play in the Premier League again until the 27th of December at eight o'clock. That's a huge gap. Yeah, and of course. Football, as we all acknowledge, is one of the things that gets us through the winter, isn't it? Yeah. And, the, and the Christmas programme that everybody complains about because the players get, um, you know, uh, worn out, uh, it actually gets you through Christmas. It, get, it helps, you, it helps yeah. you through Christmas, yep. doesn't it? Let's face yeah. it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gets you out of the house. <laughs> it gets, it gets other people yeah. out of the house. <laughs> uh, my, my daughter Martha's appalled by me saying that, but it, yeah. it, 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 does, it does help. Yeah. Um, and so, so it's not like you can say, I'm not going to watch this corrupt World Cup. I'm going, to, no. I'm going to watch Arsenal against Chelsea instead because it won't be there. You know, yeah. They, yeah. they've taken your choice yeah. away. Yeah. And, and, and I think anybody feels that about, you know, we all understand what people's views will be on Qatar having the World Cup. That's fine. But, you know, it's, it's here. I suspect I'm pretty sure people will watch it. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty I'm, sure people I'm convinced will watch it. They will. It, it's, you know. it's, it's the, the football. I don't think they, and they shouldn't feel guilty about watching it either. No. Um, well, <sighs> They shouldn't in the sense that um, is this World Cup more compromised than club football? Yes, in many ways. No, in some other ways. Uh, it, 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 there's a lot of, there are a lot of moral conundrums involved with it. Yeah, but not just football, are there? They're compromise if you support Newcastle. Compromise if there's that's, Formula One in Saudi Arabia. That's compromise what I mean. if there's world boxing in Saudi Arabia. And I remember going to the, the last World Cup in Russia and thinking uh, as we arrived, Jesus, four months ago, yeah. Um, the city of Salisbury was exposed to Novichok mm. 
I mean, there could have been, you yeah. know, a serious number of deaths in Salisbury from Novichok poisoning when the Skripals were attacked. And uh, Russia had uh, annexed Crimea. Um, they, they, they were already well down the road to being a rogue state. We all turned up in Russia and, and said, oh, this is a good World yeah. Cup. And it was a good World Cup. And there's nothing new about the states massaging what they need to do, is there? You talk about Russia. I mean, you know, we, you and I have been to Olympics in China. They literally yeah. diverted a river, moved yeah. people around. They did yeah. it in Atlanta. Yeah. Really, yeah. You know, there's yeah. nothing new about, about states getting hold of the major sporting events mm. and suddenly doing a sort of highland clearance of the unworthies, is there? I mean, they did, no. you know, we're not no. just talking about, you know, America did it, as I say, in Atlanta. Yeah, the danger is you slip into this kind of moral relativism and say, oh, well, there are bad yeah. things all over the place, so, so let's yeah. just... You, you can't do that. You no. have to judge each uh, situation on its merits. I mean, you could say, for example, that eight of the... I saw this in The Athletic. I don't know whether Charlie's still here, but um, eight same-sex relations are illegal in eight of the countries who are contesting this World Cup, eight of the 32. Yeah. So it's not just Qatar. No. Um, and it's a question of where, where you want to go with those, with that reasoning and where it takes you, but... The one thing you do have to be, obviously, is kind of aware yeah. and, and educated about it and, and, and not to pretend it doesn't matter because it really does. Yeah. But, but, but probably countries with which we do a lot of trade. Yeah, well... Yeah. Um, every, and want to do more trade. Well, people in uh, Tortoise are sick of me pointing out that um, the, the skies above Qatar will be patrolled by a joint RAF-Qatari squadron that was, that was um, created about three years ago. Yeah. So the RAF will be helping to keep... Qatar safe during the World Cup. That's how that's how enmeshed Qatar in the UK uh, economy is and UK uh, politics. There's a very very close relationship between those two countries, and of course uh, suddenly uh, it's in um, the spotlight in a way that it it wasn't before yeah. Yeah. Qatar decided bizarrely that they wanted to save the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. But so, I think I mean I'm assuming everybody is, is anybody here actually say they're going to boycott it. <laughs> I would if I could. <laughs> What's stopping you, Charlie? I, I would yeah. if I could. I'm Charlie Burgess. I would <laughs> if I could. And Mark, just because it's gone on everywhere else doesn't mean that this is any better or you can you can condone it. This is an appalling idea to have a World Cup. Yeah. You're going to, you know, your job is going to be there, which is fine. But really, we, it's, a, it's, it's no better than it was years ago. Look, it's, it's carrying on with Saudi Arabia with golf. And, but it doesn't make it any better. No, 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 it doesn't. No, you're no. saying, oh, well, because it's gone elsewhere, moral relativism continues. It's, it's a bad idea. Well, what if point I, do if I, if I could stop watching it, I would. But of course, I'd watch it myself. What point yeah. do football fans, though? We've just got to watch the game. Like, But the, it'll be to empty stadiums. Yeah, but, That's the whole but we're here it'll watching the game. What, so we don't watch the game because we object are you, are you to Are either of you going? No. no. Do you know anyone you want, who is going? I wouldn't have gone if it was in Canada or. Oh, so France. you didn't want to go? You just you, you no. didn't. No. So what? So the suggestion is we don't support England because we object to the countries. What can we as football fans do about that? That's a UEFA FIFA problem. Mm. Mm. Do you know any, anyone who is going? No. But you knew people who went who would have gone to Russia and would have gone to. No, I don't well, know anyone who is in Russia. They didn't no. Go there either. Well, Russia was interesting because the, the because the message beforehand was don't go to Russia because you know yeah. the hoodlums are out in force. Yeah, and then actually, what was interesting was the minute you got about a week into Russia, you realised the hoodlums aren't going to misbehave because if they do misbehave, <laughs> Putin's yeah, they... going to do something to them. That was basically what happened there. Yeah, I mean, the, in Russia, the FSB went round the hooligan groups about yeah. six months before the tournament and said you're leaving the country during the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if there's a squeak out, if you're leaving yeah. the country permanently, yeah. Um, Mm. Uh, to Siberia, and, mm. and they, they crushed they crushed the hooliganism yep. problem before it started because yep. the Russians had spent $20 billion, $30 billion to stage this World Cup. Yep. The last thing they wanted was a few lunatic Russian nationalists yep. ruining yep. it for them, you know. So it, it, the whole thing's a power play. But we haven't got anybody who's boycotting the World Cup then. Not that you should. No I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not saying you should. I'm just curious no. to know yeah. whether... Absolutely no enthusiasm for it. No. And I've, I've, I would be in the pub, first game. First game, I'm, I'm not bothered, it's in the one o'clock kickoff or something. Second game's on at seven o'clock at night, I should be watching it. I'm not even bothered. No, but I, I understand why there's no enthusiasm for it now, because we've still got league matches. That's yeah. why. That's why there's That's no enthusiasm yeah. for yeah. it. There isn't yeah. that sort of gradual build-up time of... Uh, you know, of getting your wall chart and, you know, reading all the newspapers and reading all the, you know, the pen picks of every single squad and so forth. Yeah. That, that will all come in a rush, won't it, on Monday week, basically. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the, 
the, the positive conclusion I reached about England, though, is that is that um, there is nothing in the system, there's no virus in the no. system that stops England being successful in no. tournaments. It's been pretty ropey since 1950, I admit that. But, yeah. but um, the player production line is there, the, 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 the tradition is there, the heritage is there, the fans are there, the money is there, the infrastructure is there. English football is incredibly strong. Um, partly in modern times because of the Premier League, but there's no, there is no virus that's going to make England fail for the next 50 years. I'm convinced yeah. they'll win a tournament probably within the next 20 years because the, the sheer weight of talent that will come through the Premier League clubs ultimately will make a difference and will put England in a final as they were only two years yeah. ago and they only lost on penalties to Italy. I know everybody was frustrated with that justifiably, but they were so close to winning that match and probably could, some people will say, should have won that match. And, and that's how close they are already to winning a tournament. And I think, it, I think it can get better if they make the right decisions. So do you think it's a bit of an anomaly they haven't won? Because you take this century, obviously France, Italy, Germany and Spain have all won the World Cup. Yeah. They yeah. were the, you know, the other four big, obviously not in terms of winning, because we haven't, but in terms of league size, aren't they? The other, the, you know, obviously Brazil have won a World Cup. But then, you know, then look who's won a Euros, Portugal and Greece. Yeah. That's the bit that stands out, isn't it? And you go, whoa. That's fine. The four big, the four big nations having won the World Cup stroke Euros it happens to be World Cup. Spain have won the others as well. That that's that's the bit that stands out, isn't it? Yeah, that's the rebuke to England that, yeah. that, that Spain and France and, and Germany. I mean, since '66, um, uh, Germany have won three World Cups and three European Championships. And you ask yourself, does that is that because Germany have produced better footballers than than English football? Uh, you could argue that one all night, couldn't you? Yeah. But the golf, if it's a golf, if it's a gap, no. it's not a yeah. big gap, is no. it, really? So, no. so England are doing something wrong that Germany are doing right. But I think England are doing more things right now, particularly with St George's Park. Um, you know, the women's team have won a, won a tournament. The, the underage teams have won lots of trophies in the last 10 years. So St George's Park and that whole system is, is working really well. And eventually that will feed through to the senior team. But it took England a long time, didn't it, to get some sort of professional approach, professional yeah. head. I mean, the stories after 1960s, you know, the, the, the banquet in the evening yeah. are fairly off the scale, aren't they? Yeah. In, terms of their, in terms of their misogyny, yeah. <laughs> their rampant sexism, and, and, and the FA Blazers wanting to grab all the glory. Yeah, the FA was, was created in the, in the 19th century by kind of older manic, whiskered, you know, Victorian committee men. And really, they, they held sway, they held on to power until it's only really in the last 10 years that they've yeah. been sort of moved off the gig, you know. Um, and the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a modern ethos now about the FA that, that wasn't there. Uh, there, was, there was committee meddling. The committee was more important than the team. The, the committee went business class. The team went, uh, you know, economy. Yeah. And the, the, the first team physio would have all the kit in his room um, piled up in bags for the team on away trips. And the... You know, the chairman of the FA would be in the suite at the yeah. top of the top of the hotel. <laughs> it was completely the wrong way around. It was completely, and you looked at it and thought, well, that 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 is not set up to produce a successful team. No. It, it's set up to serve the interests of the bureaucrats. And you know, there, there are some quite funny stories about bureaucrats in in, in my book, but um, I don't think that's the case the case anymore. Um, there are commercial imperatives that will get in the way, but. The old committee mentality, uh, the blazer mentality, I think, is largely gone now. Were, were you doing all the research? Obviously, the people who are still alive, but going back to those who are, who are not here, were you taken back by the sort of the depth of feeling for the England team from those you spoke to? Yes, I was, and and I, I um, what I realised was that um, studying the England men's football team is an incredibly good one way to understand England and the English because that the team tells us so much about who we are, uh, both in how we see the rest of the world and how we see ourselves, how we've been trapped at points in history in, this, um, in these delusions, these sense of entitlements, the, the, and the insularity is certainly there. You know, we, meant, we talked about the 1950s. Um, people were saying, you've got to change. You've got, you've, got to, um, you've got to open yourself up to these ideas. You've got to train properly, prepare properly, you know, uh, take on these ideas that these other countries are running away with. And, and, and the English refused to do it because they couldn't accept that, that they didn't own the game anymore and that the game had moved on. It had, it moved on without them. So, uh, 
But, it, but, but that's a negative view of it. But, uh, but when you go around the country, as I did, I drove all around the country, I went to all sorts of places trying to connect the dots of the story. And I, and I really understood what it, what, it, what it has meant to communities and towns, individual clubs, individual players. There were, you know, I was going to do a chapter at one point on one cap wonders. And I thought, no, I'm not, I, I changed my mind because I thought that sounds disrespectful. Yeah. If you get one cap for England, you, 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 you deserve to you know, be proud of that for yeah. life. And I also wanted to do a chapter, which I didn't have room for, on uh, people who had had an England player in their family. But again, the pride of that never leaves you. I spoke to people whose fathers and grandfathers played for England, and that is passed down as a kind of, you know, an heirloom almost mm -hmm. through the family. And, it, and, and you realise how hard it is to do to play once for England and what it actually means to you for the rest of your life and your family and your family's family. So that was very kind of um, inspiring in a way. But also, I, I, I felt reading it as well that coming through that, what you said within England was without England as well, was that other countries, much as they enjoyed beating us, there was a there was a sort of fondness, wasn't there, and a sort yeah. of almost a longing. Can you get a bit better? Because you know, because <laughs> well, I think that was, wasn't it? Could you give us a game? Yeah. Can you give us a game? Because Wembley means something to us as well, which is why we all want to play. Everyone wants to play at Wembley. Everyone wants to play yeah. at Lords. Do you know? Yeah. Everyone yeah. wants to play at Wimbledon. That sort of thing. Yeah. We want to play here. We have such a fondness for your game. We can see you're underachieving, and actually, the world game is better if you are better. <laughs> I mean, I, I got I got that sense as well. I've always That's, had that sense. Actually, it's absolutely true. They're, they're baffled by us. You know. Yeah. I mean, they. Um, <laughs> They, they They're just... even more baffled by us now, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Brexit's, you know, uh, helped with that. Um, but, yeah, they, they sort of, you're right. They, they, the other countries do think of England as the kind of wellspring of, of, yeah. of football and they, they expect it to represent certain things, you know. So so when the manager resigned in, resigns in the toilet at Wembley, you know, they think, well, what, this, you're, not, you're not meant to do that. You're meant yeah. to sort of... You know, oh, we were there that day. But that's why they was, and that's why when teams come to Wembley, they play. So well, this is it. I mean, club sides as well, isn't it? But yeah. This is it. I'm going to get to play at Wembley. I've been, wherever you've brought, been brought up in the world, yeah. And I know I get completely the Scots and the Welsh hate all this conversation. I totally, I get that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, my father-in-law was a professional Scot. You know, <laughs> <laughs> didn't live there, wasn't born there, didn't go to school there, but he was a professional Scot. I completely get all this, but well, you know, yeah. it, it, but but it is it is a it is a reality. It is. It's true. And in the 1930s, I feel sorry for the players of the 1930s because they were they were made to do a Nazi salute in Berlin, and yeah. they were used as propaganda tools. And everywhere they went, the the opponents would absolutely rip into them. Italy and Austria were in the ascendant, so, so England was struggling to cope mm -hmm. with the new new forces in the game. And they were going to Hampden Park, and 135,000 Scots were screaming at them. And yeah. every game was an ordeal for the England team in the 1930s because yeah. they had this responsibility to set this standard and be the leaders in the game. And everybody was just trying to destroy them. And the players were, the players were exhausted by playing for yeah. England in those times because it got so hard. And yeah, England have always been a target um, for everybody else. Are they still now? I, th I think they are. I think there's a residue of that. Yeah. I, 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 I find what I find now is really interesting. It's not just English football, but it's English sport. It is you know you've heard the expression a lot that the, the shirt weighs heavy, yeah. but it always comes from the it always comes from the top. Um, <laughs> We've been in this game long enough to see it with the rugby teams, the cricket teams, the football teams. It comes from the leader and and it manifests itself through us, through the media. If you are paranoid to the extent, and you probably know this story, that at Euro 2016, I'm not saying it's why England lost to Iceland. Did you play darts with them in that tournament? Yep. Your, your, the result of whoever you played was verboten, wasn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah. We were not allowed to know who you'd played or what the result was. Mm -hmm. And just this absolute paranoia. Don't give, it, don't give them fucking anything, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you get Gareth Southgate, obviously worked in the media, and before the last World Cup did what can only be described as that sort of Super Bowl square where he put all the players around the room and said, OK, on you go. And, of course, you'd think, well, everyone's going to queue up behind Harry Kane. But actually, you've got enough media in there. And one of the strengths of our media is still regional and local media, whatever the BBC are trying to do at the moment. Mm. You know, you will have people who want to go and speak to players from, you know, the third-choice goalkeeper playing for Burnley mm. will be of great interest to the, to the local media in Lancashire. And then suddenly, it, it's really not rocket science, is it? No. Suddenly you get people say to me, oh, I, I like the England team. They're rather personable, aren't they? You know, he's got a good sense of humour. Well, that's because it comes from the leadership at the top. And I think my point being that helps with this shirt, the, the shirt weighing heavy bit. Yeah. Actually, just make them a bit more personable. Yeah, it was a calculation with Gareth Southgate because he, he, he made a list of the things that were getting in the way of England being successful. And one of the things on that list was relations with us. Yep. 
Yeah, there was a there was a them and us mentality yeah. that set in quite quickly. It got very negative and very yeah. heavy. So he said, well, why don't we take this away? It was a pragmatic decision yeah. to remove that as a potential obstacle to England doing well. Yeah. And he removed it in Russia and it, and it, and it worked. Yeah. You know? Because everybody, everybody at home had a much clearer sense of who the players were and what they were about and where they came from because they were talking about it and they were open. And I was really struck in the Euros. We, um, uh, Raheem Sterling did a piece with, with Gabriel Clark in the Euros about gun crime mm. and about where he'd come from. So you probably know Raheem Sterling grew up underneath the, the um, arches of Wembley. Has he got a, I think he's got a tattoo, hasn't yeah. he? Which was yeah. quite controversial at one stage. And I was watching this and I said, I, I said, I think this is fantastic that he's done this. And I said, I'm telling you that there would have been previous FAs and previous FA uh, communications chiefs who would have pulled him aside and gone, Raheem, this is brilliant. Do it on Man City's watch, not on ours. Mm. That's what he would have said. Yeah, yeah. But actually, the mm. fact that he did it on England on England's watch, mm. you know, in a, in a major tournament being staged in England, essentially, in front of, you know, tens of millions of people, I thought, uh, you know, Gareth Southgate knew what he was doing there. Yeah. And, and, and I just think that just... I don't think you can measure that, actually the impact of that. I really, I really don't. I know I sound a bit like you know I'm going back to my reconnecting thing, but I think it's all I think it's all really important. Yeah. Don't. Uh, how does stifling someone's personality yeah. help them be successful? Yeah. In anything in sport. Um, I mean, I, I I always put that PR in football yeah. terms. And when people say to me, uh, you know, what do you think of the PR of my rugby team or whatever, I say, I say you're much better off winning 4-2 than 1-0. Mm. And what I mean by that is you're much better off having a really personable person who might occasionally just drop something off the edge, which is not that controversial, but gets people talking, the, rather than nudging and nerdling your way through an interview, <laughs> giving nothing away and, frankly, <laughs> boring the shit out of everybody. Do you know what I mean? And, and actually, you're left at the, you, you, we've been there. You're left yeah. at the end. I mean, we are, I tell you, often hundreds of stories. You go, what was all that about? I mean, it gave you a great opportunity and a platform here I remember uh, there was a, I can't remember which uh, tournament it was, but we 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 talked to all the players about 10 times. They'd all done their, their kind of rota. And um, and Darren Anderson came in for about the sixth time. Uh, and the, and the, the players had all been told to say nothing. So Darren Anderson sitting there. There was a couple of kind of polite early warm-up questions. And, um, and then there was silence, total silence, because nobody could think of a question because we'd asked all the questions. And um, John, John Dillon at the back of the room said, um, Darren, um, is there anything you'd like to ask us? You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's where we got to. Yeah, that's um, but, that, yeah. but we haven't we haven't actually got much time left, I don't think. So, are there any um, questions uh, that anybody would like to ask or points you'd like to raise? Yes. Um, yeah, Anne. It's, I thought it was you, Anne. Yes, in um, through the mirror. Well, that situation's actually improved a bit because under under Roy Hodgson, I think it, it, it that dropped to about thirty yeah. percent. So only thirty percent of Premier League players were eligible to play for England at that point, and it was it was regarded as a crisis. You know that the, the 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 pool of talent wasn't big enough. It's increased since then, and also I think there's a feeling now that if if the thirty five or forty percent pool is is good enough, if the players are good enough, it doesn't really matter that there's, there's only a couple of hundred of them. You could still you know, get a decent squad together. It, it, that was a big issue. That was yeah. a big concern, but it seems to have receded a bit. Hasn't it? Well, and if you have that 30... I mean, the argument always was, well, if they're good enough and they're playing with, you know, Bergkamp and Zola going yeah. back a bit, then they'll be yeah. really better for it. But actually, if that number's gone from 35, 33 to 40%, mm. so that the many more still playing with those top quality players, well, that's, that's actually quite, you know, from the England manager's point of view, yeah. that's, you know, that's, actually quite a, that's actually quite a big leap for him. Mm. Yes. Who's that? Yes, sorry. Yes, carry on. Um, why do you think that the, the European countries, once Qatar announced it was going to be a Winter World Cup, why didn't the European countries actually get together and say, look, this is going to disrupt our links? Why don't we get together as a block and say we're, we're in the boycott it? And then they'd be forced to do something about the World Cup. Why didn't that happen? It's a really good yeah. question because it, there was no mention of a Winter World yeah. Cup in their original bid document. They, yeah. um, you know, they won the right to stage it and then sprung this idea of a Winter World Cup on everybody. Yeah, yeah. they're absolutely adamant they were going to play in the summer. Yeah, Compr even yeah. though everyone said you can't. It's fifty degrees. You'll kill players, and they would. Somebody would have been. Somebody would have done. You cannot. Yeah. Yeah, you, you literally can't even go outside. I haven't been there, but I had friends who lived there, and they rang me up afterwards. And they went, "You can't go outside, let alone play football in June." 
So, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember them. I remember them complaining. You know, there was a lot yeah. of moaning about it. But it's a really good point. Why didn't Why didn't all the clubs get together and say, "No, this isn't happening. We're not doing this." It was. It just became a fait accompli very quickly. Yeah. You know, I lived many years in Brazil. A complicating factor there is that, like every Premiership Championship team now, it has a Brazilian, like you know, who's come up from Brazil in their late, in their early mid teens, and so the image of, Brazil, of like English football now is kind of complicated by the idea that you know, we're like this ex colonial, you know, this ex imperial power, and now we're sucking in football talent from the entire world. Mm. Um, so there is affection for, for England on historical grounds, but there's also this tension with this sense that, you know, because we've got all the sort of, you know, the power of the Premier League behind us, that we're kind of impoverishing, you know, the football of the countries that are contributing uh, to the, you know, the flourishing state of football in England. So could you address that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that is um, that's a product of the I mean the vast wealth of the, the Premier League. The Premier League is the richest league in the world, and uh, it acts now as a, as a Hoover to um, to talent in other countries. I mean, to a really fine degree. I mean, my my club, Brighton and Hove Albion, is finding brilliant players in Ecuador. So the Ecuadorians who come to Brighton and Hove Albion will say, "This is great." You know, I'm earning ten times as much at Brighton as I would have earned in Ecuador. But presumably, the Ecuadorian football is diminished by those players coming to England. But I, I think that's very much a, a global issue because they're also going to Germany and France and Spain and Italy. So it's just that the Premier League is richest and so is able to acquire more of them. Yeah. And, of course, you've got... Sorry, you've got layers then within the Premier League, haven't you? Because you, yeah. you run a yeah. brilliant club there. Thanks. And then, and, then, and then the next big fish goes, oh, we'll have... We'll have your manager That's true, and your yeah. backroom staff <laughs> yeah, then we get and your left back. Yeah, we get ramroded. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. We're, just, we're just having... Yes. Yeah, so... Um, as a Brian, <clears throat> onto a team that you keep beating West Ham, that's who we all support. <laughs> and let's talk about 1966 and who okay. won the World Cup. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is, even if we go before the World Cup final, go to the quarterfinal against Argentina, they were trying to disrupt us, they were trying to be violent. The reason why we won that quarterfinal was because it was Martin Peters to Jeff Hurst nodding it in. <laughs> that's what we did at West Ham every week. All right, now. Have you got a question in here? <laughs> <laughs> he actually doesn't have to have a question. He, he won the World Cup. He doesn't need a question. Our friend, he was from Barking. Oh, OK. Was, I'm sorry, it was yeah. a West Ham live World Cup. I'm not yeah, saying yeah. let's send okay. West Ham team to Qatar. I'm not, that sort of thing. I'm not a Spurs fan. Anyway, the point is, why don't we use the model of a successful team in the Premier League now mm. and apply that to the England team? It worked in 1960. So which team are you thinking of? Well, Man City. Well, Why don't we apply what works there and apply that to the Well, yeah, because, half, because most of them don't play for England. <laughs> Actually, no, yeah. yeah. Ron Greenwood tried that with Liverpool in the, in the, um, in 70s. the 70s, didn't he? He, yeah. he went up to Anfield and got all the, all the players together, all the top Liverpool players, and said, look, you know, you, you win everything. You're just going to be my England team. And he tried it and it didn't yeah. work, did it? So it's a slightly different dynamic, but that was a very good broadcast on behalf of West Ham, and I might tell you there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a fabulous documentary on um, Jeff Hurst in the pipeline. I can say it's very moving, so look out for that. It'll be out soon. But England have tried it before. Do you remember the early 90s, Arsenal's back four? You know, the thing that Tony Adams is doing every week on Strictly, you yeah. know? Yeah. Why don't they just play, why don't they play the Arsenal back four? Because, going back to what I was saying earlier, because it's a team, it's not necessarily the 11 individuals, it's a team. And in, in, in the end, as the, the Liverpool example showed, you can't quite graft it on, yeah. because yeah. actually you're missing, inevitably, a few of the elements because obviously that Liverpool team had you know two three outstanding Scotsmen Hanson, yeah. Dalglish and Sunes so yes. it's not quite as simple as that no although I to take your point about and it also the equaliser in the World Cup final which you failed to mention was the same combination wasn't it yeah of course yeah. yes and the fourth goal <laughs> Actually, yeah. I'm really amused yeah, by the just... third goal in your bit when, when I read the bit I did actually for the first time in my life go there's actually no way that ball went over the line, is there? <laughs> the re essentially no way. I mean, it's, it's as if the Lino just went, this is for Stalingrad, he, he and gave the goal. He guessed. <laughs> he absolutely did. Didn't he? he Basically. He was, he, he was miles away. It was uh, miles away. Because Kenneth Wilson home goes, as you quote, no goal. It's not a goal. Yeah. And then suddenly it's a goal. 
Well, if, if you don't know that it's crossed the line, you can't give the goal, can no, you? No, exactly. You have to give the benefit of the doubt to the defending yeah. team. You don't just say, oh, yeah, I think that might have been a goal, you know. So, <laughs> I don't know whether anybody saw. It was brilliant. Uh, it, you know, I know that Twitter is the refuge of the idiot most of the time. But there was a brilliant thing on Twitter this week by a, a, a site called Brian's Gun. I don't know who it is. Anyway, he had done, he or she had done brilliantly every goal in the World Cup final. Did you see this? Yeah. Time-wise. Yeah. Fantastic. And actually, it was very funny in the comments because the Scotsman went, yeah, you put a goal in there, which wasn't actually a goal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you were trying to ask yeah. a question. I was, I was trying to come back on the point the man at the back was saying. I don't know if it was because of facing you. Hmm. But he's talking about imperialism and Brazilian football. I've got a book on my shelf at home called Football, the Brazilian Way of Life. Hmm. And in it, they export footballers all around the world. Hmm. It's not a British thing. There's Icelandic footballers described in that book. So I would reject the idea of British imperialism. It's just it, they're an exporter of footballers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah, fair when, point. When Shakhtar lost yesterday to um, Leipzig, their coach came out to Archers and said, uh, well, "You know, we are missing all the all the Brazilians." We yeah, yeah. Big, yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Even in Ukraine, huge numbers. Mm. Well, you think yeah. about how many Brazilians? You know, William played for Shakhtar, didn't he? How many great Brazilians have played there? Yeah, yeah. You know, they've started yeah. there, haven't they? They've started their European journey quite often there. Mm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I'm not actually talking about imperialism. <laughs> 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 it all comes back to imperialism. Your youth team, you know, anyone who's playing decent in your youth team, is heading out, you know, you might not be to England, but it's, you know, it, the top level talent is coming here because here is where the sort of biggest paychecks are. So all I'm saying is that, you know, that is kind of affecting the way that English football is perceived. Sure. Not just in Brazil, but in Argentina and Ecuador. And, you know, you spend Saturday in Brighton, your Ecuadorians are great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's understandable. that Dan, highly influential Dan Johnson. Isn't <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just want to kind of expand on that point about why it wasn't a kind of uh, a kickback against the, uh, the the World Cup being moved to the to the winter. I know Richard, I used to work in the Premier League context, I worked in Richard Scudamore for many years, and Richard Scudamore tried to lead a rebellion. He thought it was an absolute outrage that they bid and they won for the Summer World Cup. He was like, FIFA, you awarded this, Qatar, you bid for this. That's what you should do. That's what you should reap whatever havoc comes to that. Um, but there was no appetite for it amongst the uh, amongst the other European nations, and you know, I remember he was in he was in um, I think it was in it was in, it was in Qatar. It was a big meeting, and he said, "I'm going to go in. I'm going to make the case." And about halfway through the meeting, he texted me and said, "It it's not landing. I'm not going to be able to do it. But what I am going to make sure is that it's truncated." And so he stripped out international breaks. Um, and what he was absolutely obsessive about was making sure that we got the Premier League got Boxing Day football. And he said commercially and for fans, we need to come back on Boxing Day. <laughs> yeah. And that's and that right. and that's why we've got this really kind of truncated thing. The question I want to ask uh, Paul particularly is do you think that so I think over the, over the long history of the of the English game and the complicated relationships contained within that game. I think something that's kind of held England back for many years is a tension between the league, and not just the Premier League, the Football League, uh, which was, uh, and, and the FA, which was, let's not forget, that tension was the genesis in the Premier League. And actually, you know, I, I, you know Paul will know the, uh, the four letters I'm about to say, the elite, the EPPP, the Elite Player Performance Plan. And actually, that was a rare moment where Premier League and the FA, yeah. Trevor Brooking and Jed Roddy sat down and said, "How are we, how are we going to how are we going to sort this out? How are we going to sort this? Uh, you know, more and better homegrown players, you know, deeper pool of talent, but a better pool of talent as well." And we came together, and I think you know we're we're kind of reaping the rewards of that now. And it was interesting. You read that team out uh, from two thousand and four, and it was a good team, but you go below that. There wasn't much behind that. Mm. And now mm. we're going, oh, well, if we lose X players, all right, we've got Y players. So I just think that, that kind of easing of the tension between those kind of you know, big beasts of English football has, 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 has helped the English team. Yeah, yeah. 
I can remember the conversations we had with you about that, Dan. <laughs> Dan, yeah. Dan, do you know what I thought was interesting? Because obviously, I don't think it'll ever happen again that two World Cups were awarded in the same night, weren't they? Yeah. And I, 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 I remember very clearly I was in Adelaide. It was during the Ashes. Yeah. England won the Ashes in Australia. It was during then. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Australia bid for this one, Qatar. And they really thought they had a chance. And, of mm. course, reading the Aussie press, you think, funny enough, you fall into the trouble. Bloody hell, the Aussie's going to win it because that's what the Aussie press is like. And so they were absolutely outraged that they got one vote and whatever. Mm. But I remember thinking, and obviously we, England, have bid for Russia. And I remember thinking, well, Qatar, Wow. What's going on there? But I do remember thinking, because obviously it's not the Russia of today, well, Russia is a football nation. Mm. You know, Russia is a football nation and they've never had the World Cup before. I don't, I, I remember I was not outraged by Russia getting it at all. Mm. Thought, mm. you know, in a way it was like, why shouldn't they get it? Yeah. We've had it once. Why should, why should we get it for a second time when they haven't had it before? There was that, there was definitely a sort of a different feeling. Well, it, was, when, it, was, it was interesting because Blatter didn't want Qatar. Because what? Blatter didn't want Qatar. No, he well, he, did, he didn't, he did he? In America, he, he, had, he had his eyes on a Nobel yeah. Prize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Liz, how are we doing? We've got time for one more, one more. point one more. question. Uh, yes. Go on, Mike. Go on, right. Mike. Good one, finish up. <laughs> uh, on the assumption that England fall flat on their face against Wales. Honestly. <laughs> who's going to win the World Cup? And as journalists, what are the themes you're looking for? Is this... An African breakthrough at this World Cup. Is, is, well, I think that's a, I, I think that's a really interesting point Europe. about that because you often have heard over the years, well, South Americans can't win in Europe and vice yeah. versa. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's none of that anymore. So th there is no particular bias in favour of anybody. I mean, Pele is still twenty. How many years out now is Pele? Twenty-two years out about an African team. I think yeah. I I thought France the other day, but actually, I'm going Brazil now. Okay. I'm right. in Brazil. So you're going for the favourites. Right. Okay. Yeah. Are they favourites? <laughs> yes. Okay. I haven't even I haven't actually had a look at that. Okay. No, I, well that's the thing. We're also immersed in club football. Nobody's yeah. had time to get the form book out and say who's gonna win this bloody yeah, thing, yeah. you know. Uh, well come on, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to avoid the question, you know. Yeah. But, um, all I all I'll say is that every all the all the time we spend talking about England and whether we can whether England can win it, it ignores the fact that there are seven or eight teams, seven or eight countries in this tournament that can win it. Yes. So England are gonna have to deal with all of those. Even if they are good enough, they've still got to beat these teams in big knockout games, and that's been that's been Can England's I say top. what the knockout games might well be? Yeah. If it all goes according to plan, and even you know England will, um, England will think they should win the group. There may well be Welsh people in here. England will still think they'll win the group. Yeah. So if it, if they do win the group, there's every chance it's Senegal last sixteen, mm -hmm. and then it's France quarter final. But it never quite pans out the way you think. But that that could well be the route. Okay. Right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. What about the semis? I've oh, got that. Well, I, I, I didn't actually look that far. Oh, pessimist. So I've got Brazil. <laughs> yeah. You've um, gone. Uh, I've got a. I've got a. I've got a soft. Do you think spot. it's as open a World Cup as ever? It's such an easy thing to say. Yeah. It's, I know. If you can't think of what to say, that's really open ground national this year. <laughs> yeah. It might be because of this whole continental business, it, mm. and because of the continental business and mid-season, mm. it may be more open. Than, I still think before. it's going to be hot and humid, so maybe maybe yeah. Brazil will be least inconvenienced by that. Uh, and they're, they're, they're certainly it is talk, thirty-three they're, apparently at the moment. During they, the are, day. they are talking a good game, Brazil. They've got they've got good players. Yeah, I'll go with you. I'll go with Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. But can we just can Neymar just not dick about, please? Oh yes. God! Well. Do you know what I mean? He's such a good footballer. Please stop dicking about. <laughs> yeah, but Bolsonaro's buddy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, Liz, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. We've played it. <laughs> <laughs>